Hi, my friends. I'm Gio, and thank you for joining me today. Today's story about a gay man falling in love is called Sunrise with You Gave Me Goosebumps. Let's go ahead and begin. I'm going to solve all your problems, Mom announced. Better hurry, because I have to go to work, I said. I'm Damon Preston, and I had a feeling that life was about to get complicated. Mom lived to cause drama. I wore my dark hair long and pushed it past my ears. I want you to get dressed in your nice clothes and remember to shave, Mom said. Lord knows it's been two weeks if it's been a month, and would it hurt you to go to church this week? Heaven knows I've asked you week after week after week. Melanie and her mom will be here in 30 minutes, so make sure you look nice. Sunday go to church nice. Thursday, late afternoon. Almost time to head for work. I mindlessly replied, Mom, Melanie's a nice girl, but I'm not interested in her. I should have known something was up, because Mom was in her best church dress, with her favorite church hat, and wearing Grandma's old pearl necklace she bought in Hawaii. Mom folded her arms and gave me her pouty face. I told you I'm going to solve everything, because I finally understand you. What are you talking about? I asked. According to Reverend Sawyer, Mom said, not bothering to hide the smugness in her voice, there is no such thing as being gay. It's a myth. Reverend Sawyer was the evangelist of Mom's church, and he and I don't agree on anything. I usually kept my mouth shut because then they didn't pick on me. But it sounds like open season had just begun. Diplomatically, I said, then what am I, Mom? You have a severe social phobia that won't let you talk to girls, Mom said. It's epidemic now, especially in Japan. We have a whole generation of young people that are too afraid to talk to each other. According to Reverend Sawyer, we are going to have a population shortage if this keeps up. A lot of us won't see any grandchildren, and I want to see my grandchildren. That's a stupid theory, Mom, I said. Mom continued speaking as if I hadn't said anything. Think about how wonderful you and Melanie can be together. Such a perfect couple. So tonight we are having a party and getting past this social awkwardness. Since you won't talk to her and she is too shy to talk to anybody, I've invited her and her mother for an intervention. You don't have to be nervous because I will introduce you. No, Mom, I said. I have to work tonight, and even if I didn't, I'm still gay. I'm not interested in her. Don't use that word. You're not gay. You're socially inept, Mom said. And don't worry. I'm making shrimp scampi with a garlic cream sauce. You love shrimp scampi. And Melanie's mom and I will go for a walk right after dinner to give you to some alone time. Why does mom set me up like this? Is this the third time or the fourth? Is she that desperate for grandkids? I chose the nicest response when I finally said, Mom, I work until closing, tonight and for the next five days, so don't set me up on a date. I don't have time for it. You never told me you had to work, Mom said. It's on the calendar on the fridge, Mom, I said. I update the calendar every month, just like normal. You never check, and you've never asked about my schedule. Take the night off, Mom said. This is more important. And get a third strike this quarter? If I don't give proper notice, they'll fire me, I said, and left for my basement bedroom. 
Mom followed me to the stairs and said, Why are you fighting me about this? Melanie will make a perfect wife and will give me cute grandchildren. Her mom and I are best friends, so you two are perfect. Imagine Damon and Melanie Preston walking down the aisle. Sheer perfection. Now, after you're married, I'll let you two live in the basement. For a small rent, of course, and I'll save part of that rent for your eventual down payment. My grandkids are going to have a house. Not tonight, Mom, I yelled back. Besides, I already told you, I prefer guys. No, you just need some help to be social, Mom said. Me and Susan, that's Melanie's mom, have it all planned out. You and Melanie will get married, live in the basement, and your first kid will be a honeymoon baby. Susan and I don't want to wait any longer for our grandkids. Then why don't you and Susan have a baby, I said. Don't be silly, Mom said. That's your job. Good Lord, I muttered. Stop being so stubborn, Mom said. This is for your own good. Running down the basement stairs two at a time, I yelled back, You never listen to me. I have to get ready for work. What about the shrimp, Scampy? I've already bought the shrimp, and you know shrimp doesn't save very well, and Melanie and her mom will be here in 30 minutes, Mom said. Mom, I have to go to work, I said. Wait, did I miss something? Melanie's coming here for dinner? What have you done? It's called an intervention, Mom said. Now change into your nice suit, okay, and please shave. Mom gave me an odd, mischievous grin. I stripped, jumped into the shower, and was dressed in my old khaki shorts and a faded t-shirt and my worn sneakers and my DIY vest. I didn't have time to shave. I work at the DIY warehouse, lumber division. Since we are approaching the weekend, it's about to get busy. Customers will come in tonight to stock up for their weekend projects, especially if they are working on decks or remodeling their home. Fencing is a big deal this time of year, too. It's late April, and even in Clark County, that's where Vegas is and where I live, it's starting to warm up. A couple of months from now, Vegas will become too hot to want to work outside. But right now, it's the perfect temperature, more or less. I ran up the stairs to the smells of mom cooking shrimp in the frying pan and making the cream sauce in a saucepan. The rice cooker was loaded with tons of white rice. If I didn't know better, mom was expecting more people than me, dad, and her, and Melanie, and her mom, mom's best friend since elementary school. I checked the time on my phone. I barely had time to make something for a late dinner when I took my break. I rolled up a couple of burritos with some leftover taco meat and cheddar cheese, tossed on a bit of salsa, and sealed them in a plastic container. I checked the time. Like it or not, I had to leave right now. I told you I was making shrimp scampi, Mom said, scowling as she judged me. And you were supposed to wear your suit, and why didn't you shave? I gave her a quick hug and said, I told you I had to work. Ties are not allowed, too much of a safety hazard, and I'm not getting oil and sawdust on my suit, and my Sunday shoes have no traction, so I'll slip all over the place. Are you trying to make me look ridiculous? Don't you understand? Mom yelled. I'm trying to help you be social. Think about how romantic tonight would be. Reverend Sawyer is an idiot who doesn't know anything, I said, grabbing my burritos and heading for my car. Oh my gosh, yes he does. He has a degree. And besides, I've got everything already arranged, Mom said. I've invited your aunt and uncle to give you moral support so you don't have to be afraid, and Melanie has invited her grandparents. It's time you learned how to ask a girl on a date, so that's what you're doing tonight. I have to go to work, Mom, I yelled back. 
Mom waved a spatula around as if it were a sword and shouted, Teaching my son how to talk to a girl is more important than going to a silly minimum wage job, so you will stay home. Now run back downstairs and shave. I want you in your Sunday best in five minutes. Do it now. I order you. I can't believe what I'm hearing. The anger flared inside me, and I wanted to swear, but I stamped it down. No, I said. You don't have to be afraid of being social. Susan and I arranged everything, Mom said. We will even teach you how to make conversation with a girl. It will be the perfect night. You're ruining my life, I shouted. Mom, I have to go to work or else I'll be late and fired. It will be my third strike. Remember, I took a night off to go to the Jumping Pyros concert two weeks ago. Reverend Sawyer said our kids would be difficult about this, Mom said. I'm putting my foot down. You will stay and learn how to talk to a girl or so help me. No, Mom, I said, and headed out the front door, right past my Aunt Viv. She held a large casserole dish that smelled like her famous triple cheese scalloped potatoes with ham, while my Uncle Roy followed close behind, carrying a bag of French baguettes. Based on their smiles, they already knew about the intervention. Of course, my uncle teased, saying, Where's the fire? You'd think you weren't ready for the old ball and chain. I'm so screwed. I let a little bit of the anger out when I said, Mom, I work until 11.30, and then I have closing. Why won't anybody believe me when I tell them I'm gay? Viv looked at my mom and said, Wait a second, didn't you tell Damon to take the night off? Mom never said anything, I said, pushing past my aunt and uncle. I knew he'd ruin everything, Mom said, so me and Susan planned a surprise intervention. We have lots of fun games planned for tonight, so Damon can learn to be social. I expect we'll have Damon ask Melanie out by the end of the night. I have it all scheduled. Unbelievable, I said, and walked quickly to my car. Had Mom planned out my entire life? Damon Wallace Preston, Mom yelled, running after me. You're embarrassing me. Get back here. I've spent a lot of time getting tonight ready. Would you knock it off, I shouted. I have to get to work before you get me fired. I climbed into my car, a black four-door Chevrolet Impala that was seven years old, but ran like she was only four, and started the car. The radio automatically turned on playing some song by Scarlet. I shifted the car into gear and prepared to back up. A bang came from the back of my car. I stopped. Mom had slapped my car, specifically the trunk, hard. Mom stood behind my car, arms outstretched with her palm smashed into my trunk, and she was screaming, You will come back inside this instant. You will obey. I couldn't back up with her there. This was getting ridiculous. It didn't matter what Mom planned. I had to get to work. Now! Mom, I yelled out the window. Get out of the way. You're going to get me fired. I don't care, she yelled. I'm going to help you get past this stupid social avoidance, fear or whatever it is. Get over yourself, Mom, I said. I have to get to work. Get out of the way. I'm doing what the good reverend told us, Mom yelled, and she wouldn't budge. She held her hands on my car as if she could physically hold it back. You're twenty-two, she kept yelling and calling herself gay. You can't talk to a girl. Do you know how embarrassing that is? I can't be late again, I screamed, jumping out of my car. I carried the burritos with me and started speed walking away. Checking my phone, I pulled up the Uber app. One was only three minutes away. I activated the app, and the automatic payment went through. As I tried to get away, Susan's car pulled up. Melanie sat in the passenger seat. Both were dressed in their Sunday best. 
Susan had this odd, smiling, smirking expression on her face. And when Melanie saw me, she smiled the biggest grin I had ever seen. Between her and her mom and my mom, we had three sharks circling for the kill. As Melanie got out of the car, carrying a tin-foiled casserole dish, she said, Your mom said that spaghetti salad with extra tomatoes was your favorite. If I'm late for work, they'll fire me, I said. Her face fell. She looked at me, and I guessed she just realized I was still in my store uniform and walking away. What's going on? Susan said. Damon Wallace, Preston, you get back here right now, Mom screeched. I'm about to get fired and you won't let me leave, I yelled back. Two minutes until the Uber arrived. I know, Mom said. I'll write an excuse note like I did back in high school when you had the flu. Oh, my God, I muttered. Jobs only accept notes if they're from a doctor, and it was an emergency. You seriously want me fired because you think I can't talk to people? You're insane. Aunt Viv and Uncle Roy stood on the front porch, still holding their food. A second car pulled up, an older car with a set of older people in the front seat. Melanie's grandparents. Both were smiling and I could see a tall, wrapped package in the back seat. Oh, my God! Had they brought an engagement present? Everybody had known about the intervention, except me. This can't be happening. Melanie set her casserole dish on their car and ran after me. You're supposed to ask me out. Your mom promised. Mom ran about 20 feet behind her. I turned to Melanie, suddenly feeling terrible. But what choice did I have? I quickly said, Your mom and my mom set this up because they thought we would make cute grandkids. So they invited everybody to a big fancy family dinner. They never even told me about it until five minutes ago. If I stay, I lose my job. If I stay, I have to lie to you for the rest of my life. I like you, but I don't love you. Like I keep telling everybody, I'm gay. But your mom said she was going to fix you, Melanie said. She said you loved me. Where did you ever get that idea? I asked. You were the first boy to kiss me, Melanie said. We were 15, I said. Your mom promised, Melanie wailed. Damon Wallace Preston, you get back here right now, Mom yelled. I am so ashamed of you. My phone beeped with an incoming notification. The Uber had finally arrived. I looked up just in time to see a small car turn onto our street. I ran to it, opened the rear door, and jumped in. The driver had a friendly grin and had half turned around to greet me when I quickly said, Get me out of here, fast. DIY warehouse, she asked. If you hurry, I can avoid getting fired, I said. Fast it is, buckle up, she said. She clicked into gear and she squealed the tires as she sped off. I made the mistake of looking back. Melanie looked as if she'd been hit with a broom handle. Mom had a bizarre, angry look about her eyes, like maybe she'd been betrayed. Susan and the grandparents were gossiping together. The only person who seemed to enjoy himself was my Uncle Roy, because he laughed his head off. Dad finally peeked out the door, his expression unreadable. When I get home tonight, Mom would either give me the silent treatment, make snide comments for hours, or scream at me for days. Yippee, I can't wait. My car is stuck at home. I'm on closing shift for the warehouse. Mom will be waiting up to most likely yell at me. I'm getting a migraine already. Guess who is not going home tonight? 
Time to find an all-night bar and make the best of life. Why does Mom want to fix me? I'm not broken. She refuses to accept that her only child is gay and doesn't want kids. Therefore, in her mind, I'm broken. The first text from Mom arrived as we were getting close to the warehouse. I will never forgive you for embarrassing me like this. And then one came from Melanie. Your mom has promised that you love me, but have been afraid to talk about it for years. Reverend Sawyer has always given good advice. Give him a chance. You don't have to be afraid of me. And then one came from Susan. You are the most selfish person I've ever met. Why can't you understand that your mother is only trying to help you? And then she demanded a long apology, started swearing at me, and then she reached her 160 character limit and started another angry text. I imagined Mom, Melanie, and Susan standing around together and sending nasty text after nasty text. The orbital bombardment had started. Did I say this was giving me a migraine? I've already got one. We arrived at the DIY warehouse. I put my phone on airplane mode so I could get some work done. Would Mom show up at my job? This whole afternoon bummed me out. I should have gotten my own apartment a year or two ago, but I wanted to avoid student loans, so I still lived at home. Evidently, that gave Mom the right to dictate my life. Did she think I was still 14? Closing went about normal and I took a late-night Uber to Sylvia's bar. It's a little out of the way, but since I didn't have to drive, it didn't matter. Sylvia's is a homegrown bar run by Sylvia, and has been a local fixture for a decade. They also make and sell their own label, Three Sisters Craft Beers. Their winter ale is a little dry for me, but their dark lager, though a little more expensive, is my favorite. The outside of the bar looks like an old house converted into a bar with a big neon sign that said Sylvia's Bar. It probably was a converted rambler, but it always had customers, even this late on a Thursday night. Inside, it had light oak tables, a dozen booths, a large light oak bar with olive green stools and pale olive green walls. The place had a dozen or so customers milling around, with a guy flipping quarters into an old-fashioned jukebox. A couple of bartenders poured drinks at the bar, with the most popular drink being their Three Sisters Pale Ale. I took a seat at the bar, scooped out a couple of peanuts from a small dish, and waited for one of the bartenders to stop by. It took about two minutes before Sylvia herself stood in front of me. What can I get you, friend? Three Sisters Dark Lager. And is it too late for grilled cheese and fries? Nope, she said, and returned a minute later with my beer. I took a sip of the cool beverage and sighed. The day had its problems, but right now was perfect. Sylvia wiped the counter with an old rag, looked at me and said, I've got five minutes. You want to talk about it? I hate my life, I said. My mom set up a surprise intervention party because she doesn't accept I'm gay. I'm not going back home. Know anybody who needs a roommate tonight? As a matter of fact, Sylvia said and almost laughed. She looked behind her at the small kitchen and yelled, Gus, you won't believe it, but I solved your problem. A moment later, a man pushed through the doors that led to the kitchen. He was about my height and age, but a hairnet held his sandy hair in place and he carried a plate with my grilled cheese and fries. Clean-shaven, the man had perfect skin and perfect teeth and a perfect smile. His eyes were crisp and blue and locked onto mine for a second. Something about him seemed comfortable, as if I could relax around him. Sylvia, order up, he said. It's for this guy, Sylvia said. You still planning on Goblin Valley tomorrow? I'm Damon, I said. He smiled and said, I'm Gus. I need someone to help cover gas, 
camping fees, help carry equipment, and doesn't mind camping in southern Utah. You interested in a bit of a road trip? It's about seven hours away, and time is down to the wire, and I'm desperate. What is Goblin Valley? I asked. Not a lot of people have heard of it, Gus said. It's a strange place in southern Utah, filled with some of the most bizarre rock formations on the planet. I'm trying to be a photojournalist, and I'm putting together a photo expose for the online magazine Remote. And my ex-boyfriend was going to go with me, but we broke up a couple of weeks ago. What happened to your boyfriend? I asked. We had a falling out and a fight almost two and a half weeks ago, Gus said. I do a lot of traveling and camping, and he didn't like traveling and camping. I figure we'll take one day to drive there, a couple days taking pictures and touring the land, then take another day driving back. If the article actually makes any money, I'll split it with you. We'll take my car because I just had it serviced. Interested? A road trip with a complete and total stranger to a state I've only been to twice and to a place I've never heard of? Call me insane. Call me crazy. Call me absolutely bonkers. But it sounded a lot better than staying around Vegas. When had my life become a total drama mess? I'm in, I quickly said before I could stop myself. Let me know when so I can arrange some vacation time with work. Can we leave tomorrow afternoon? Gus asked. I have reservations for a campsite for the whole weekend, and the day after tomorrow I've made arrangements with a park ranger who will give me a tour, and they've given me special permission to hike to some places people don't normally see. I met Gus's blue eyes, hoping I could trust him. I needed out of Vegas. I'll talk to my boss first thing tomorrow morning. We exchanged contact information, and I stayed at a cheap motel for the night. When I Ubered back home in the morning to get my car, I looked out. Mom and Dad had already left for work. On the kitchen table was an envelope with my name on it. It probably contained a letter where Mom was trying to guilt trip me into marrying somebody. I am so done with this. I left the letter unread. But I did write a note on the envelope. Hey, Mom. No means no. You will never understand how much yesterday hurt. We need a lot of time apart. I'll call when I'm not so furious with you. Your used-to-be loving son, Damon. I packed most of my stuff in my car, then packed a suitcase for the trip. The fridge had the leftovers from dinner last night. I made me a sack lunch and left. If all went well, I wouldn't come back here for a while. Maybe Gus needed a roommate in addition to a camping partner? I've never been camping before in my life. Hope I don't embarrass myself. I met Gus a little before one. I parked my car at his apartment. We had a light lunch, and then we took off for Utah, for Goblin Valley, taking I-15 northbound. We traded who drove every 30 minutes or so, and we talked about our lives, about our jobs, and since we had so much time together, I told him about what had happened last night. Gus proved easy to talk to, and I liked him. We drove into the park near 8 in the evening. We had arrived in an alien land, and the closest comparison I could use was, Welcome to Mars. Old, odd rock formations welcomed us, and they were all reddish in color. The ground was reddish in color, too. Odd rock formations stretched in every direction. I had never seen anything like this. We navigated a couple of roads until we came to a campground. We were the second party here, but the other party had chosen a campsite further down. Gus opened up his digital camera and took pictures of both our campsite and some of the nearby rock formations. His pictures of the setting sun were spectacular. Yesterday, I was in the mess of my life. Today, 
I was having an adventure. Since I'd never been camping before, I let Gus take the lead as he organized where the tent would go in relation to the fire pit. And after we rolled out a pad inside the tent, we rolled out a couple of sleeping bags. Gus had placed small bundles in the fire and had it burning in less than a minute. And I did something I have never done before. We grilled hot dogs on skewers and roasted buns on the edge of the fire. Gus pulled out some marshmallows, and we roasted those. Gus took a heavy pot, lined it with foil, mixed in a box of yellow cake mix, and melted butter. Added two cans of peaches, a little bit of milk, mixed it up, and set it on the edge of the flames. Not even the regal serves peach cobbler for breakfast, he said. That won't burn or anything, I asked. It always works out, Gus said. So far away from home, from anywhere really, my cell phone couldn't find service. When I stepped away from the firelight, I did find something incredible. Stars. We don't see them down in Vegas. Here, there were thousands. And when I shielded my eyes from the firelight, I saw even more. Do you know the Big Dipper, Gus said, pointing at a section of the sky. It points to the North Star, and it looks like a curved serving spoon. He helped me find it, and then the North Star, and the Little Dipper. I love coming out to places like this, he said. It's like a different world. I quickly agreed. We sat on some rocks, staring at the infinite sky above us. Did you show this to your old boyfriend, I asked. Gus paused a second before finally saying, he didn't like camping or the great outdoors. He called it spooky. But technically, this isn't camping. See those buildings over there? Those are showers and restrooms, and park rangers check on the campgrounds all the time. In the silence, I realized why Gus's previous boyfriend had called it spooky. It wasn't just silent. It was complete silence. It was so quiet that the crackling of the fire stood out, and the little bit of noise from the other campers made it all the way down to us. They had music lightly playing. I was used to the constant car noise and constant chatter of people and constant bits of music of the constant background road hum that was the neon brilliance of Vegas. And now that I was without it, the world became silent and even more alien. I thought I heard the breeze. And our phones wouldn't work. We were cut off from the world. Or the world was cut off from us. Spooky was one word to describe it. Peaceful is how I would describe it. For a little while, I was disconnected from my life from the mess, and I needed that break. I relaxed into the silence, into the stillness, and somehow the moment became intimate and special. My hand and Gus's hand slipped into each other. That little bit of warmth drew us closer, and I said, I see why you love it out here. After an hour of talking, we made our way back to the fire, sat close to each other, and simply enjoyed being together. In the added warmth of the fire, we leaned against each other and just enjoyed being together. That night was fun, not in any kind of weird sexual way, but there I was, sleeping in the tent, sleeping with a stranger, and sleeping in a strange place. I should have had trouble falling asleep. I didn't. I slept steadily until four or five in the morning, and then I went out into the darkness and watched the stars. Something needle-thin streaked across the sky. A meteor? A satellite? The chill night air made me shiver. Just like I'd seen Gus do last night, 
I placed a couple of logs in the hot embers. A minute later, small flames and a tiny burst of heat rewarded my efforts. I was alone with my thoughts. I had time to think about my life. I had time to think about Gus, a complete stranger who had accepted me into his life. I laid back and stared at the stars, enjoying the early morning air and peace. The air smelled of peach cobbler, and I couldn't wait for breakfast. At about six, Gus got up and found me sitting by the fire. He didn't say anything, but checked out the cobbler. Satisfied, he served me a steaming portion for breakfast. We sat in the quiet and watched the sunrise. That sunrise, that special sunrise with Gus gave me goosebumps. That had never happened before. Gus and I hadn't even kissed, but a connection had formed between us. At about eight, we had packed up our tent and sleeping bags in the car when a park ranger cart pulled up. Stacy Hudson was one of the rangers assigned to the Goblin Valley State Park, a woman about our age with her black hair pulled into a ponytail. You can leave your gear here because we're only hiking, she said. Goblin Valley has six hiking trails, most of which are a mile in length and relatively easy, but make sure you bring water. It gets hot out here. Gus had a high-end digital camera with an amazing zoom feature. Tonight, he'd plug it into his laptop to begin editing his expose. But first, we had to take all the pictures. We took the Carmel Trail first, with Stacy telling us the history of the place, the geology, and pointing out interesting features. One of the features that made Goblin Valley unique from any other place on Earth are the goblins. Rock formations that cannot be described. Some seemed little more than lumps. Some looked like creatures running about. Some seemed like boulders stacked in weird mud formations. Some were only a few feet high. Some were a dozen. All were reddish, and I'd never seen anything like them. Gus must have taken a thousand pictures on that hike alone. Our next hike was a more strenuous hike, showcasing even more weird rock formations. There must be thousands, and somehow they had survived the tens of thousands of years since Lake Bonneville had once covered this region. Our final hike was to a large open area called the Goblin Lair. Hundreds, if not thousands, of formations begged to be looked at. Stacy left us to wander the area. And I don't know how many thousands of pictures Gus took. I took a few pictures with my phone, enjoying myself in the quiet and solitude. The sun was dipping below the horizon when we got back to camp. Quickly, we put dinner together and I started the fire. We grilled hamburgers and buns for dinner and more marshmallows for dessert. Gus made a blueberry cobbler to rest in the fire. While we waited for the food to grill, Gus brought out his laptop and previewed all the pictures he'd taken. The article will only be about 200 words long, Gus said, but they'll want 20 pictures for the photo spread. Only 20? I asked. Looking at the total of pictures we'd taken today... Even the best layout artists can only fit a sample of what I take, Gus said. It also means that sometime later I can write a similar article and use some of the other pictures that I didn't use. The night air chilled us a little more than last night, and Gus and I scooted closer to the fire's warmth. Gus draped a blanket about our shoulders, and I pulled it tight about me. Gus began talking, telling me about his failed relationships. The man had left him because Gus liked to camp, to be outdoors, enjoyed being in nature. He wrote about the places he'd been and became a moderately successful travel author, and he had many articles published. When weather permitted, Gus traveled around southern Utah, 
southern Nevada, parts of California, and even Arizona. He attended Native American festivals and wrote about them. And he also attended Harvest Day celebrations from Vegas to Montana and wrote about them. He also wrote about the Pioneer Day celebrations he attended in various cities in Utah. Every year he picked a city and joined in their pride festivals. He wrote about those especially. It wasn't obvious, but Gus had written hundreds of articles about places he traveled to, but had a lot that hadn't been accepted for publication. That was why he worked at Sylvia's. He might be a writer, but he still had to pay the bills. The published article he was most proud of was a four-page photo spread about a ghost town I'd never heard of, Morgan's River, and the article had been printed in a magazine for retired people who liked to travel. Gus had found vintage pictures of the old town and posted them alongside current pictures. Before I knew it, I had asked, Do you need help on your next trip? His brief smile told me he'd like that, but then he said, It can be a lonely life. Once you get the travel bug and start seeing the world, a lot of people don't understand what has happened to you. I held his hand and softly said, I love how you see the world, and I want to see it like you do. I need a change from my life. My parents don't listen to me, and college is turning into a royal pain, and I hate how Mom refuses to believe I'm gay, and she is actively trying to ruin my life. Gus thought for a moment before he said, The University of Utah is hosting a tribal celebration next weekend. I think it has something to do with the spring celebration, but I don't know what. Do you want to come with me? It takes about six hours, and we'd have to find a motel for the night. We can split the cost. Only six hours? Salt Lake City is closer than Goblin Valley, I asked. You hop on I-15 and take it straight to Salt Lake, he said. Goblin Valley is a little more complicated to get to. I'd love to come, I said. I can even do a little bit of research about this festival, what tribes are involved, and what they are celebrating. We talked deep into the night and previewed all the pictures we had taken. By the time sleep had overtaken us, we'd narrowed the pictures down to a hundred of our favorites. The next morning, while I scrambled some eggs and fried some bacon, Gus wrote the rough draft for the article and included pictures of some of our favorite goblin and rock formations. During breakfast, I proofread the article, and after breakfast, he got it ready to email to the editor once we had reception. After breakfast, we closed up camp, took a few remaining pictures of the two of us goofing off, and then got underway. If all went well, we'd be back in Vegas about four or five. The drive back seemed more leisurely, and we talked about our trip. Gus told me about some future trips, and he invited me to join him. And then we planned a weekend getaway to Dead Man's Butte to photograph some of the old buildings. It was one of the few historic mining towns that had survived but its neighbor, the ghost town Morgan's River, had not. It's a little late to ask, I said, since we kind of spent all that time together. But I like you. I like spending time with you. Could I ask you out sometime? Let's see, Gus said, smiling. We both like camping under the stars, exploring new places, and experiencing history. Sounds like a good place to start, What say we talk about it while we get ready for our trip up north? We stopped at a diner near St. George, Utah, and discovered we had reception again. While Gus sent his article to the editor, I checked my phone. Mom and Dad and Susan and Melanie had all texted or called multiple times over the last few days. I'd better get this over with. I called Mom. When are you coming home? It's not too late to apologize. How dare you be furious with your own mother, she yelled. I'll talk to you when you learn to treat me with respect, 
I very calmly said, and hung up. She called back immediately and began yelling. I remembered the peace of sitting by the fire and talking about the stars. I simply said, I'm not a child. You cannot treat me this way. Goodbye. Though the phone rang, I ignored it. Gus had made some final touches on the article and looked at me. Do you want me to leave so you can talk to her? No, I said, and called Mom back two minutes later. As the phone rang, Gus whispered, Tell her you are with your boyfriend, and he treats you with respect and love. <laughs> I had to smile, because now I knew what to do. So when Mom picked up, I quickly said, You yell once, and I will not talk to you for a week. Mom took a pause. If you continue to yell at me after that, I said, I will not talk to you for a month. You will treat me with respect, or we will not deal with each other. Ever. I am sick of you not listening to me. I am sick of your unacceptance of my life. I am sick of your constant interference in my life. You either accept me as I am, or I am out of there. In a much calmer voice, Mom said, What about Melanie? What about the things Reverend Sawyer said? I spoke with the Reverend, and he said he'll come talk to you. I felt my eyes roll to the back of my head. I took a deep breath and said, You're still not listening. You still do not accept me. This isn't about what you want, Mom. This is my life, and none of you have any say in it. Mom swallowed. I think she wanted to start yelling, but she didn't. But she finally asked, Where have you been? Do you have a place to stay? Gus quickly mouthed, Do you want to stay with me? I nodded. Suddenly tears were in my eyes. I tried to keep the emotion out of my voice when I told Mom. I was with my boyfriend. He's cute and adventurous, and you wouldn't believe the things we did over the last few days. He showed me the stars, and he listens, and he makes me feel like I'm the most important person on the planet. When we are alone... He gives me goosebumps. Gus and I arranged our schedule so we could travel as much as we could. Festivals, historic towns and places, state parks, national parks, ghost towns, everywhere. Gus wrote the articles, I proofread them, and we both took thousands of pictures. We had pictures of places during different seasons and different times of days and more festivals than we knew existed. About a year and a half into our relationship, Mom finally began to accept us. She actually did us a huge favor. Reverend Sawyer had a friend who worked at Diamond Publishers. They wanted a coffee table edition book about Nevada's ghost towns to be published just before the following Halloween. It took Gus and I six months of constant traveling, but we put it together. And then it took more times in local libraries researching ancient newspapers and land records. But we finished. On one of our few times back in Vegas, we surprised Mom and my family. You see, Gus and I finally got married. The end. Thank you, everybody, for joining me for this story. I'm Gio, author and reader and of this story. I appreciate you being with me. Thank you. Peace.